Thank you, City Clerk. Are we live on Facebook as well? Okay, great. Welcome, everyone. Good evening. Bienvenidos a todos. Uh, calling this meeting to order at 6.01 p.m. May I have you all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You get a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. You get a roll call vote, please. Council Member Higley. Yes. Council Member Mitchell. Yes. Vice Mayor Kelly. Yes. Mayor Jimenez. Yes. Moving on to reporting on closed sessions. We had none. Announcements and presentations. None as well. Uh, now on to our city manager report for a water supply update. Thank you and good evening, Mayor and Council and members of the community. Uh, we have a PowerPoint for a quick, uh, it's been a few meetings, but we did want to check in on some water supply issues. While that's coming up, though, I wanted to make one other announcement and just let you all know we have put some information out on this. Uh, but a heads up to the Council and the community that the city will be giving away 862 uh, countertop compost bins. Uh, in the next several weeks. As you may recall, we received a Cal Recycle Grant. Cities have received these to help with the implementation of new mandatory composting regulations. Those have been in place since January. Hopefully everybody is familiar with that at this point. Uh, and cities have been able to take these funds and, and deploy them in different ways to support with efforts to help the community in achieving that requirement. Uh, and Healdsburg is doing something that I think is, is very cool is uh, actually providing vouchers uh, in this month's utility bills. So those are going out. Uh, and if customers bring the vouchers back up to one per household, and we have 862 is what we were able to buy with the grant, uh, we'll be giving those away to, to our households to help them with composting. I can say I beta tested one of these bins and was free of smells and bugs for a few weeks. So I think they work. Uh, and I can say from personal experience, they, they really do make it easier to compost on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's, I think it's a, a really neat program that our, our public works department is leading and just want you all to be aware and let people know that those vouchers will come either digitally or in paper with people's utility bills this month. So with that said, I, I will provide also a quick update on our water supply as noted. Next slide, please. Uh, I know you're all familiar with this one right now, but it's been several meetings and we did just want to check in midsummer on how we're doing. Uh, these are the last several drought seasons and you can see where that dark black line um, and sitting in this is Lake Mendocino, which is about 80% of our water supply, uh, sitting at about 47,000 acre feet, uh, which is, as you see here in the bullets, double where we were last year. So we were we are undoubtedly still in a drought. We are undoubtedly still in a, a time of concern and a time of required conservation. But uh, the difference between where we were last year uh, and where we are now is still really palpable. Uh, there's some better water, water management, I think, going on at a regional level and water sharing. Uh, it's also a credit to our community and the other ones that use Lake Mendocino for water supply, that conservation is also quite a bit higher. So a lot of credit to the community. Um, we are uh, well below where we'd like to be. Uh, that target, that dotted orange line is actually the target supply, uh, but much, much better than we were last year. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of our current conservation, I have seen some confusion on this lately. So we wanted to just make sure we emphasize this point. Uh, as with all of the state right now, we are asking our community to, to conserve 20% relative to a normal year, uh, and we're holding steady at 30. So you, I, I hope you're not getting tired of hearing that, but I've been saying that for several meetings now. Uh, Healdsburg continues to do more than what we're asking for. So that's a great thing, and hopefully that continues. Uh, there was some news recently that the state water board has curtailed some rights. Um, in Lake Mendocino, but we do have continued water access. You can see we actually have a legal right to stored water within Lake Mendocino. So just to, to be clear, we do not anticipate at this time changing that 20% number. Uh, obviously, we never want to promise 100%. Uh, lots of things can happen. It's not just lack of rain, but regulatory things and water sharing 
uh, and issues with water rights, but it is our expectation and our hope at this point that we will stay at the 20% number uh, throughout the summer. So I want to make that clear since there was some, some confusion out there when the state curtailments were announced recently. Uh, and of course it helps when Healdsburg continues to do better than that number. So that, that increases the chances that we'll be able to stay there. Um, and our focus, as you can see, as it always has been, uh, is really on outdoor water usage. That's the lion's share of our water usage. Uh, and when this community is successful in cutting back on that irrigation, it really does pay dividends. So we are grateful and appreciative that the, the residents keep doing that. Next slide, please. And I, I think we'll conclude here, but I wanted to do a check-in. There is a little bit of news in terms of the two major capital projects that we're trying to pursue, nothing official to announce, but you, you'll see first off as a reminder, the recycled water pipeline, as you all know, several months ago, we received about $7 million from the state water board in a grant. Uh, you'll recall that the total project cost is actually uh, closer to a little bit shy of 15 million. Uh, but since we have this money and we have an urgent need and a shot clock to use those funds, our team is modifying designs right now so we can do a phase one build out of that project and get the recycled water into town and get it to start serving some of our facilities, even if it's not everything we intend to do over time. So that work is ongoing uh, and we do anticipate, you can see here, uh, completing design um, by this time next year, hopefully, uh, and then the following year starting construction. And I know that seems like a long time when we have an urgent drought, but this is a uh, as you see more of the design in the in the months to come, you'll, you'll I'm sure appreciate this is a very complex project and actually a pretty aggressive timeline. So we're proud of that and we're we're fortunate to have the money and not not that many months away from being able to see some of the benefits of that project. Um, the other major project, as you know, is the aquifer storage and recovery wells. This would be a way that we could tap into groundwater when needed and also um, return water back. Um, when appropriate in times of wet wet years and, and replenish the aquifer. So a, a true resilience project. Uh, and we did learn in the last couple of weeks as we've been pursuing through a, a BRIC program as the acronym, federal funds, we've passed a, a significant milestone and been passed along the initial review of that project. And it looks like that could yield about $6 million in funding. That is not a grant at this time. They will ask us lots of technical questions and we'll engage in a back and forth. Uh, but it is a sign that one of these applications that we've had in for several months seems to be doing well and seems to be on a good track. So we're not gonna declare victory on that one yet, but that could be meaningful money. Um, again, $6 million, it does come with a 25% match, but and that would be a challenge, but one that we would figure out. Uh, it's obviously worth it to leverage all of that outside money. So we'll keep watching that and we'll keep you posted on that. Um, and then longer term, we do have some additional funding pursuits. Uh, we have an application with FEMA, which as we've mentioned in the past is unfortunately one that takes, you have to measure that review in years, not months, but we are staying on it and we are staying engaged and making sure our representatives are aware of our need. Um, and we were included in, in the Federal Water Resources Development Act that passed the House uh, about a month ago, and then is, is slated to head to the Senate in the next few months. Um, there's actually an authorization, not an appropriation, but an authorization for $23 million for water resiliency projects in Healdsburg in that bill. That is not an allocation of funds to us. What, what our friends in Washington have described that as is a, is a hunting license and the authorization to then work with the Army Corps of Engineer uh, to try to seek those funds going forward and, and actually partner with them on, on completing these projects. So that is definitely a long-term play, but it's still really good news and does give us a leg up in, in chasing funds as, as the federal government puts more and more money into infrastructure. So that's something we're actively looking into as well. It's not something many of us have been involved in in the past. So we're working with experts and spending some time with the core uh, to make sure that we position ourselves as effectively as possible to be able to go out and chase those funds in the next couple of years. Um, again, it's a longer term play, but I'm very hopeful that if you combine that with these funds that we've either secured or hope to secure in the next couple of months, uh, and then have this longer term plan as well, I really do feel very optimistic that we'll be able to complete the entirety of these two projects we've described, um, and maybe even use some of the multiple funding sources to 
to leverage each other and cover some of the match, reducing what the city has to put in. Uh, but for instance, the recycled water pipeline, even if we can do a, a great phase one, there will be plenty of additional places we'd like to get that pipeline to. So that's really good news. So wanted to leave you with that. We haven't been talking quite as much about the drought this summer, which is a good thing, uh, but we are working really hard. So to our water and utilities team, I just wanna offer some appreciation that they continue to work behind the scenes and push really hard to get funding. And that continues to be a pretty promising process. So I think that is the final slide. I'm happy to take questions if you have any. Any questions from the council members? Council Member Hagley. On the um, recycled pipeline, if we do phase one, my understanding was the recycled pipeline, if that's complete, it's about 40 to 40 million, 45 million gallons of water savings. So if it's just phase one, what does that drop down to? Like, you know, or maybe I'm going to look and see. It, it's, I'm going to see if Terry can bail me out on this one. I'll say as he makes his way up here, it was quite a bit more than I would have guessed. It's, it's, it's pretty good bang for the buck, but I'll let Terry walk you through that. Yeah, so just pulling numbers off the top of my head, um, and we'll likely talk about this a little bit more at the next council meeting um, with the contract, but the uh, pipeline footage will be roughly half, but we'll still be able to deliver roughly 30 million gallons of water per season. So it's still a, a, a larger amount than what you'd expect. So we paired about the project back quite a bit, but we're still able to hit some of the major users like the golf course, the cemetery, rec park, um, and some of the uh, athletic fields that are used around town with the school district. So we'll still get a lot of benefit and we'll be able to secure those fields, those play fields during the summer, even during drought years, so we can continue the work. Um, but um, we just won't be going as far north with that pipeline as we originally had thought. And then what's the ballpark estimate on the ASR? As far as timeline or cost? It, time, uh, in terms of gallons being able to store and potentially replace so uh, each water. well i think we're assuming each well and we're we're trying to build a project to build three different wells would produce about a hundred during the summer months and we're we're if recalling those numbers correctly it's between six to eight percent so even though we're going to face additional droughts there's still going to be need for conservation but we can reduce that need for conservation by roughly 60 percent so that helps to alleviate um, some of the extreme conservation that we saw last summer and so that's you know each little piece helps us get to that point where yes you're going to still have to conserve in a drought year but maybe not as deep as you would have otherwise and then final question right now if people want reclaimed water they drive out to foreman lane and fill up with trucks so part of bringing the purple pipe there's a location in town correct we're we're looking at in the design and that's what we'll bring consultant on board is we're looking at different locations along that pathway that will be appropriate for truck traffic and a kiosk for a filling station so that we can have filling stations closer to town closer to the sites that we'll be using it okay thank you vice mayor kelly um, Director Kelly, one more question for you on the aquifer storage well recovery recovery well project. We have a potential lead towards a six million dollar grant. What is the total cost of that project ballpark? Right now, we're estimating roughly eight point six million, and okay. so the grant will offset seventy five percent of that cost, and then the city will have to come up with a twenty five percent match. Now, there's still quite a distance to go in far as timeline for FEMA, but getting past this initial approval saying that this is a valid project and should be funded by BRIC is, is a major milestone. So we need to fund 25% of the 6 million or 25% of the total cost? 25% of the 8.6 million. So okay. 6 million is the grant. The difference between 8.6 and, and 6 million is the piece that the city will have to fund um, and find funding over the next several years to, to do that. Great. Thank you. It's exciting. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. yeah, I just wanted to add, um, you know, it's a really exciting time to see, you know, I know the the journey is long here, but it's great to see seed funding come to these projects that have been long awaited in our community. Um, and it's, you know, great to hear that residents are conserving at 30% and that the city is charging a path forward in water resiliency. So full effect from our community. Um, thank you, city manager. So now moving on to public comment. Uh, this time is set aside to receive comments from the public regarding matters of general interest, not on the agenda, but related to city council business. Pursuant to the Brown Act, however, 
the city council cannot consider any issues or take any actions on any requests during this comment period. Um, so we'll go ahead and move with public comment in person first. And for those individuals on Zoom, please use the raised hand feature. Welcome. If I could, um, it would be nice. You could just turn on the microphone so the folks on Zoom can hear. Okay, great. Um, it would be nice in that uh, 30 million gallons. It's nice to know we have that. Will that be at a future presentation? Is that enough to cover the fields as well as the residential use? Um, will there be a surplus uh, in that wastewater? And it was nice hearing the breakdown of the outdoor, the indoor, but what we, did, what we didn't hear was a hospitality, kind of our transient water use, kind of if we'd know how that breakdown uh, is going. Thank you. Yes, please welcome to the podium. Hello, City, City Council, Mr. Mayor. Uh, a lot of people know me. I was born and raised in this town. I grew up here, a lot of changes. Um, Davy Crockett, known as put my gear on. I walk around town and tweet the tourists and stuff like that. But I have a couple of things to say and I try and get to the point and not take too much time. Well, my, my beef is with the city about affordable housing. There is not none in this county or this town, period. Okay, no more hotels, no more um, no more uh, wine tasting places. You already got enough in town, you know. Um, no expensive restaurants. You already got enough adults, you know. Uh, the people that live here, you know, they can't afford those prices, you know. It's too expensive, you know. It's fine for the tourists. They probably got the money, you know. Probably this, this, this town probably makes money off the tourists anyway. That's another thing. Anyway, um, so, you know, the and. Like I say, affordable housing, you could build affordable housing on Dry Creek Road here of Foss Creek. Put them in as soon as you can. Some units in the, the mill the district, not affordable. The end of town towards the dumps, not affordable. There's no affordable housing in this town whatsoever. The, the rents to the roof, it costs too much. It's too expensive. You can't afford a house. It's over a million dollars just to build a darn house. You know, that's too expensive. If you're in low income and minimum wage, I mean, low income and social security, there's no way in hell you can afford a, a, a house. No way. I lived here all my life. I can't do it. I'm, I'm going on 71 years old. I'll never be able to afford a house. Never. And you know, you got, it seems like you guys are just, all you care about is just, you know, taking care of the wineries. You know, I know you, I know you got to make, you know, make the money and the wineries have to make the money, but it seems like, like the, the, the winders are telling you guys what to do and you don't guys don't care. You know, if you don't like it, move. It feels like that, you know? I've been in a trader for six years. No power, no water. Why don't you try that in my shoes on just social security? Why don't you try that and see how it feels? I'm tired of getting kicked out, you know, from place to place. Like I say, there's no affordable housing. There's none. So um, what's the, one other thing. I just like to know how many people were actually born and raised in this town because I lived here all my life. Like I said, I've seen so many changes. People were born during the 40s and 50s. You know, they don't know, they don't know what this town was like and what it's like now. You know, they can't find any place either. A lot of them are just moving down the state and they're moving out. Like with California, can't afford it. Too expensive, you know? So like that, you know, it's just... It's ridiculous. So please, please, please do something this year, right away. Get some affordable housing in, in this town. You know, I don't care if it takes a year or a couple months, you know, or a year to have some affordable housing, but do it now. Get off your butts and do it. Okay. I guess I spoke too much, but anyway, I'm just tired of it. I'm tired of getting kicked out everywhere I go. And it's costing me money, and I'm getting tired of paying. Thank you for your comment. Any other individuals for in person? Welcome. Yeah, thank you, uh, Bridget Mansell. I'm happy to be back in the chambers. I'm happy to see some familiar faces, and I really respect the service that you have given to the community. There's so much energy in this room right now for me and the emotional landscape of service and duty and 
I do know what you're talking about. I want to just echo that there are some real passionate pleas right now about what's happening in our town and what's continuing to happen. And I know you care. I know that you're off your butt all the time. That's why you ask good questions. And that's why staff is here not to just make money, but to actually have some difference in what we need to do in our small town. So I just want to thank everyone for that and also introduce myself as a candidate for the two-year position. Uh, that's not on the agenda. Um, my other colleagues, I think I have at least one other person, uh, Ron, who will be running. And I just found this out this morning. And I just want to start out with the spirit of just really feeling good about service and to know that it's not easy to want to do this kind of work, uh, especially where you are, council members, mayor. And just to let everyone know, we do have a crisis in that we do have people that don't feel connected to our community for lots of reasons. It's not just because of Zoom. Um, it's not because they don't have a house that they can buy in an expensive place called Healdsburg, California, but they just don't feel connected. So I just want to bring that up. That's one of my um, hopes is that in my candidacy, I can elevate that voice. Um, the other thing I want to mention um, that's on the agenda tonight is lately we've been talking about what we're going to do with balance in this town. And it's a metaphor for, I think, lots of things, not just socioeconomics, but also how we can create a place where people feel belonging. And I just want to mention that that's one of the values I'd like to see more of. I'm not sure what we can do to change the culture in this town, but one thing I do know is that we have a lot of wonderful public places. And with this money that might be being asked from the voters in the next this next election that you all are supportive of a parks bond. Um, I just want to clarify, we really want to make sure we have people to go to the parks. And what I mean by people is people that aren't visiting the parks, but they live here. So I would encourage us to kind of remember the sense of belonging in the land. And if you're going to ask me for more money on my tax bill, I really need to make sure that there is an effort to create more housing for the missing middle, which is the expression we used back in 2014, which is essentially the group of people that are like myself, who live here, who have a fixed income or on a pension or teachers, people that really care. And they want to be here and do the work and volunteer and choose to come back on a council that really isn't easy to go back to. There's no money in this job. Um, there's a health plan, but that's about it. So when you come on to council, if you didn't already know, if you're running, there's no money in this job. It's really about you. And if you don't have any financial conflicts of interest, it's really not helpful. So if you're not in an industry where you have your name up there, thank you for listening. And I'm welcoming myself to the process. Thank you. Any other individuals for in-person comment? Seeing none, we'll move over to Zoom. Mayor, we have one at this time, Brian Keegan. Good evening, Mayor Jimenez and council members. Um, my name is Brian Gagan. I live at 320 Hayden Street. And I, I want, I'm, I'm, I'm um, speaking tonight because I want to encourage you to revisit the idea of uh, the open streets concept in the plaza area, specifically in the block of Plaza Street between East and Center. Uh, during the COVID shutdown days, we caught a glimpse of what, what, what might be possible on this block when it was closed to vehicular traffic with a more imaginative approach to transforming this block into a pedestrian area. I believe a valuable public resource could be created. And you're all probably aware of the uh, transition of the alley next to Black Oak Coffee. Um, this formerly overlooked downtown space has been transformed into an outdoor seating area for customers, as well as a space for public art with the addition of the Monarch Project's mural. The plaza block between Center and East could be reimagined too, transformed from a mere thoroughfare into a unique an attractive public space suitable for all modes of pedestrian travel, as well as a venue for small events and art. I hope you'll keep this concept in mind and I, I hope it can become a reality. Thank you. Mayor, it looks like that's it for public comment. Thank you. So seeing as there's no further public comment, we'll move over to the consent calendar. I move we approve the consent calendar. Second. Roll call vote, please. Councilmember Higley. 
Yes. Councilmember Mitchell? Yes. Vice Mayor Kelly? Yes. Mayor Jimenez? Yes. Uh, public hearings, we had none. So now on to old business automated license plate reader program. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, Matt Jenkins, Police Chief. Before you tonight is additional presentation for discussion and direction on an automated license plate reader system. Next slide. As a quick background, um, as you'll recall, Council asked staff to provide a detailed report on ALPR technology when the police department did this annual update in February. That presentation was held on May 2nd, 2022. And at that meeting, council provided additional direction to staff to hold a community input meeting to get um, additional input from the community on a system. Next slide, please. As a quick overview of what ALPR technology is and isn't, um, LPR cameras are, they capture computer readable images of license plates and vehicles, gathering objective evidence and facts about vehicles, not about the people inside of them. It gives um, our staff real time alerts of uh, vehicles that are wanted to police to help us solve crimes. LPR technology is not facial recognition. They are not designed or set up to look at who is in the vehicle. Um, or to compare that to any other database of facial images and names. Um, it's not tied to personal identifying information being named, so security numbers, date of birth, driver's license numbers, et cetera. Uh, it is not used for immigration enforcement or traffic enforcement. And the data is automatically deleted after a specified time period. Next slide, please. So the police department held a community meeting on July 18th to discuss the technology, the draft policy, and receive any feedback and concerns. The announcement of the meeting was posted on social media. It was in the city manager's Friday update. Um, and those social media posts gathered about 7,400, um, was a reach of about 7,400 people and had over 550 engagements. The meeting itself was attended by three community members. And at that meeting, the program received both some positive support and some hesitation about the program due to concerns about privacy, as well as safeguards for the misuse of ALPR data. Staff has been working on taking, next slide, thank you. Um, the, the feedback that was presented at that into the draft policy changes, um, as well as incorporating best practices um, in ALPR technology into our policy manual. Um, as it relates to privacy, additional language has been added to that policy to clarify that information will not be sold, accessed, or used for any purpose other than for a legitimate law enforcement purpose, as we discussed at the last meeting, or public safety purpose. Um, releases to other agencies would require written request and approval from the chief of police, myself, or our police lieutenant, and ALPR data would not be released for the purposes of federal immigration enforcement pursuant to state law. Next slide. Additional language that's been added to the policy regarding the misuse as additional language requiring confirmation of ALPR hits through CLES, which is the California Law Enforcement Telecommunication System. In a nutshell, what this is saying is if the officer or one of our staff members gets an alert that there's a wanted vehicle, the officer once, if they find the vehicle driving around, they have to then visually confirm that it's the same vehicle, run the license plate again through CLETS, which is our access to DMV and other records, and make sure that it is still currently an active and wanted vehicle within those systems. There's a requirement to properly log in and out of the system to ensure accurate auditing. So when we talk about auditing, that we actually know who is running each vehicle through the system. The policy gets into additional um, definitions of what's permitted and not permitted for the system, uh, clarifies a violation of the policy, subjects the employee to criminal, civil, and or internal discipline. And at, we added additional verbiage in there that requires the audit, audits to be conducted at least annually. Next slide, thank you. 
at, at the last meeting, we talked um, quite a bit about record retention, as you'll recall, our current record retention for ALPR technology that we use for parking enforcement sets the retention at one year. Staff has surveyed other cities using similar technology in the range that the cities are at is anywhere between 30 days and two years. Um, this is one of the areas that some of the community members did express concerns about is in the sense that the longer you have and hold on to the data, there's obviously a larger propensity or not propensity, but a ability for additional data to be misused. Um, our recommendation at the staff level is that any change in the retention period for ALPR technology on a fixed camera system be not less than 30 days. That's kind of a point which gives us enough time that if a case were to come forward that's delayed in reporting because someone's on vacation or we just haven't found the right person who has relevant information to the crime we're investigating, that we're able to get that information. Um, at the same time, not holding the information for an extended period of time where it's not of value. And then we would also request that there's no change in the data retention for the parking enforcement system. The way parking enforcement tickets are issued with the system, there, if we reduce it from a year, there's a greater likelihood that we cannot properly adjudicate a parking citation. For example, you're parked downtown, you get a ticket, you don't realize you got a ticket and you drove away and it flew off somewhere along the road. You may not know you get that ticket until you go to re-register your vehicle and there's a parking violation on file that you cannot and you can't register your vehicle until you clear that ticket. Um, that one year gives us the ability to go back and properly adjudicate that. We could tell residents or anyone who got the citation, you're beyond the limitation for being able to file it, but we want to do our best to be able to adjudicate those tickets, um, particularly if something isn't properly adjudicated or issued. So, um, so again, our, our rec the staff's recommendation be no less than 30 days. And then next slide, please. So what we're asking tonight is by motion to receive direction on whether to proceed with a fixed LPR system. And if there is direction to proceed, whether to amend the city's record retention schedule related to ALPR data for a fixed system. I would like to note that in conversations with the city clerk, the current resolution for our record retention schedule does allow it to be amended um, with the direction from the city clerk in consultation with both the city manager and city attorney um, to amend it as necessary for changes in legal regulatory or operational requirements. So it wouldn't necessarily have to come back to council with a clear direction of what that should be set up. With that, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chief Jenkins, bringing this back to council for any questions. Yes, council member Mitchell. Thank you. So I had a couple of questions. Uh, so I'm assuming there are two separate databases, one for the parking enforcement and the other one for the stationary um, readers around town? Correct. The parking enforcement system is not designed for use for an AL, um, for a fixed system. So it would be two separate systems and two separate databases. Okay. And so how often would you anticipate that you might be looking at the cameras for the non-parking uh, situation database? So in the fixed ALPR system, we would be using it uh, when there's a crime that would necessitate us to search in it to try and identify a vehicle. It's really hard to say how often that might be. Um, it could be a handful of times a month. Um, we could have a spree of activity with vehicle descriptions that might prompt uh, additional searches. It's really tough to say at this point. So um, since there are license readers, let me ask a, the question if you maybe perhaps related a little bit to a recent incident, if you have a car description that you and you know where they're leaving town, are you able to sort of reverse engineer this to try to find that vehicle? Yeah, so ALPR technology is goes beyond just reading the license plate. It is also able to detect whether the type of car, whether it's a sedan, a truck, it can detect 
the color of the vehicle and certain characteristics like a lumber rack. So the system would allow us to search using certain parameters like that um, in your words to reverse engineer and find a license plate that would go with it. So it would be helpful in that kind of an investigation. It, so. it could significantly help in the investigation of crimes where we have a vehicle description. Yeah. Yes. And so related to the retention period, um, what I read, it sounds like that if you if you have something under an investigation, you can um, save that information in a different database and then get rid of the rest of that information after a year. Is that if if it ends up being a year time? Is that correct? So the it would automatically be deleted after a year. We would have to identify a need to retain it in conjunction with a specified crime to hold it um, as evidence of a crime. And it would be offloaded out of the ALPR system and stored as um, in our property and evidence room in a digital format, just like we would if a crime occurred and we had a service search warrant in a bank and get electric re electronic records back. And then my last question for now anyway is, um, so if another agency asks for information from the city of Healdsburg, I'm on, what I understand is it has to be written and very specific and either you or the your lieutenant would make the determination. Are you able to just say no? Or is, that, is there a certain legal requirement that would, if they meet that, that you would have to turn the information over? There, there's no legal requirement to share any information. Um, it's a best practice when we're working together to be able to share information to help other jurisdictions solve their crimes. One thing that we know is criminals just do not stick to the jurisdictions they live and work in. They tend to move around. They may not, it may not be our case. They may be people who are coming here to commit crimes. And so the, what we can do to help them investigate their crime is permitted under, we would try and work cooperatively with them just as if we were investigating a crime in their jurisdiction, we would hope they would reciprocate that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Mitchell. I'm gonna jump in here with some of my questions. Um, so thank you for making it clear in your presentation that, that we are not going to be tracking people and only vehicles. But again, I wanted to be clear um, to have you let the public know if this will be used in any way for immigration enforcement. Um, how is this prohibited at the state and how, so how is it prohibited within the city of Healdsburg? Thank you for the question. So yes, um, it's there are several, um, there's two state legislations, the Values Act and the CARES Act, that prohibit um, agencies in California from cooperating with federal immigration officials for the purposes of immigration enforcement. So those acts have been codified into government code that would prohibit us from doing that is also prohibited within the policy um, going even that step further that we will not cooperate at that level um, for those purposes. You mentioned um, that there is an annual audit. Um, and so once the audit is completed, um, who will be receiving the audit? Is that the city manager or would it be this council on an annual basis? It's um, right now it's set up that the audit would be done internally. The operations lieutenant would be the one responsible for completing that audit, presenting it to me. It is something that I can include in the annual update to council that's provided in early spring. I, I think I would like to see that in our audit for our first year, just because I'm considering this as, as a bit of a pilot program. This is our first time doing this as a city. So seeing what the results are from such an audit, I think would be important for me and for this council in the future. Thank you. Those are all my questions for the time being. Council Member Hagley. Um, yeah, I'm fine to just have it included in, the, in an update and I don't consider this a pilot program. I think this is a much needed program. We already have an existing ALPR uh, uh, program right now. Um, <clears throat> my question is related to kind of the process. Let's say hypothetically over here, Right now it's what, 640, there's a shooting. Um, you would get notified. And then how would this in real time happen? Like, okay, say the system is set up and witnesses say, oh, they went north of town. 
then what can you walk us through the process and timing and and how that would be incorporated into a uh, your response? Yeah, so the way it would happen is um, any of our staff that has access to CLETS, which are our sworn officers and dispatchers, would have access to the system, assuming they've received the proper training and its use. So at the moment, there, there is actionable information on a license plate, a partial license plate, or a vehicle description. They'd be able to input that into the system to be able to start getting real-time information back if there is um, any vehicles going through that. That doesn't mean that we'll get anything, but what it does is it provides the officers with an investigative direction to go and looking at vehicles that match the description going in the direction that it may have been described. So then they can go back and kind of backtrack from there and see if it is an associated vehicle or not. Okay. Um, yeah, I think the other questions were covered. So I think that was it. Thank you. Vice Mayor Kelly. How many other cities in the Bay Area have this type of program? A large number in the in the Bay Area, especially. Can you yeah. speak up just a little bit? Sorry, there's oh, sorry. motion behind. Okay. No, th there's a large number in the greater Bay Area that have them. Uh, I don't have an exact number readily available. The in the presentation I provided last week or last month, um, there were about roughly thirty listed in there in the Greater Bay Area. Um, a survey by the State Auditor's Office several years back had it at over sixty percent of agencies in California um, use ALPR technology in one form or another. And for the cities that have chosen to not adopt it, can you talk about what were some of the concerns that residents or folks had that were being weighed against kind of the pros and cons of doing it? It sounds like we're, we hear the pros, but why have cities chosen not to? Unfortunately, I cannot comment on cities that have not adopted it. I don't know what their reasoning for not adopting it would be um, or if it's even been considered. And in terms of the length of uh, the storage, which it sounds like was one of the concerns and often used as one of the, the civil liberties concerns around, you know, people, Big Brother watching and Big Brother is storing your data. Um, what, what do you feel, it sounds like 30 days would be a minimum that you feel necessary for investigative purposes. What do you given maybe inquiries from other districts or when you guys have been looking for cars that once you finally get a description and you're reaching out to other jurisdictions to see if they have any vehicles on their cameras or ALPRs that you've you've been able to determine what do you think is the right balance to strike there between holding on to a lot of data for a long period of time versus being able to do the job which is why we're potentially adopting this tonight yeah very good question. I, I think that 30 days puts us at a point where we're going to capture probably 99% or more of those cases where we're going to have to go back. There's always that chance that we'll have one crime that's reported significantly late and we will miss that opportunity to use the system. What that does is puts us in the same position we're in today investigating it. We just don't have that information. There are those other uh, um, instances where we might have a major crime. And we, but we don't have the vehicle description, and we'll have to look at um, what those processes are to take that as just the data collection versus evidence of a crime happening and storing that data um, as evidence. And that's, you know, the very one off type cases that happen once every several years or more. Okay, thank you. Um, seeing as there's no further questions at the moment, we'll take this to public comment again in person first. Welcome. Ron Edwards is one of the three that was at the July 18th meeting. Uh, I'd like to go through some process here. Um, it would have been nice in the agenda if there was an update because I was not aware that the manual that was presented at the July 18th meeting was updated. Um, so I'm just hearing about that the first time tonight. Um, 30 days. It's a little short, you know, initially I was completely against this um, as one who has a property that we've just sold in Mendocino to where 
I have an advanced tech septic system on that. And every time it's reported to somewhere, the data is on the usage of our septic system. So I couldn't even go to get away. So we are really having technology encroach in everything we do and it's incremental. So we give up a little. However, there have been some incidences that have happened that I think this technology would be very helpful. However, I think the program is flawed. Um, we are not, I don't hear any discussion about putting information out or signs that says <coughs> Hillsburg has automatic license plate readers. That might be a slight deterrent to a few, maybe not all, but some. Um, and saying that there are laws that says we can't give this over. Marin County was sued for providing information. <coughs> so, excuse me, there needs to be more than just saying it's a policy it really needs to be updated. And I think a year is a little too long. I would much rather see quarterly reports, particularly with the new program, so that you can see what's going on. And the biggest weakness of this program is it's not in our police cars. So in other words, if an officer gets an alert, they don't have that technology in their car. It has to come from a briefing. So I think if we're going to do this program, I don't know what the funding is that wasn't presented. Um, but we really need a full, robust program to make this work. And I think that once we get that, your concerns, because we are having incidents happen from outside our community. And so by having these entrance and exits, we can better understand what's coming and what's going, which is why I think the 60 days would be a good period of time, considering the normal uh, at the presentation, the Hillsborough policy was 30 days. So I'd really like to see a lot of these things looked into the program to be more effective. Thank you very much. Yes, please welcome. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I've lived in the Hillsburg for 42 years. Um, the reason I bring that up is because I've lived outside the city limits and haven't been able to participate in uh, city politics. Um, so my question is, uh, about this is, and the officer didn't quite uh, answer it was the size of the cities. It, it seems to me that Hillsburg, I've lived here a long time and I'm not completely clear on the crime rate that we have here. Although I'm sort of, I pay attention. I read the press Democrat, I read the trib when it was more readable. Um, so I, I wonder how, and also the cost, it just seemed to me, and I'm just in here for the first time, so I probably shouldn't really say too much, but I have been in town 42 years as far as living here. I just find it interesting that the size of this community and what I perceive as a crime rate, which I might be wrong, officer, about what I read and see, and I also have friends in other police departments, uh, bigger cities. So I'm, I'm wondering how, how it, if this is necessary, and I don't even know the cost, what that at this point in time and his point about not having the, having the readers in places as opposed to in the vehicles you know uh tied in with the uh, parking uh you've got the, those cameras in the parking cars in the parking tickets seems like they should be somehow hooked together if you can't do that and how much it's going to cost and how how much we need this in this community to spend that kind of money and to have the observation and have to deal with all those little particulars that you've question wisely about immigration and other things. And I'm sure that the police officers will do the right thing, but there's still a lot of room for mistakes. Thank you, welcome. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. And thank you for explaining something that didn't make sense to me. So I appreciate that regarding the issue of just like what this means to the city in terms of just future. And I do think it's dangerous to laugh at implications around immigration. I think that the mayor is correct. I think it would be really wise to do a pilot program. And I looked up quickly um, about pilot programs and Saratoga is doing it right now, the city of Saratoga, and they actually publish where the cameras are. And it's just really a better plan for what our legacy is. The reason that some of you are in office today had to do with a protest that then a mayor was displaced because of issues around a question around police. And I think the culture right now is really inviting us to see things in a different way than just, yeah, we're cool. Um, it's okay to move forward and do things. So I would concur with the 
uh, former speaker, I, I think pilot program is a really good way to put it. Thank you, Mayor, for bringing that up. I also think audits are really important in areas around privacy, and I don't think we should take anything for granted right now. The national is volatile. We have people that do, in fact, come into office and they implicate or create different systems for immigration, and we've been through so much in the Trump presidency around this, and I can't believe in a city of 33% or whatever the demographic is, any of us especially people that are not somebody that's maybe going to get pulled over as quickly. Uh, just data can share that. So I would be really cautious around this program. And there's nothing laughable about using this system to address immigration enforcement. Let's take nothing for granted. And my white privilege certainly can shroud my ability to understand what it's like to be on the street and be pulled over or to actually have my identity questioned because of something that might be because of a plate reading. So I really hope you do the auditing. I hope you see it as a pilot program. It's not a temporary thing. It is definitely something you always need to check in on your numbers. And Fourth Amendment rights, I know they're there, but we have seen over and over how this gets crazy. And as if you're going to implement this, and I don't even know how much money it is, good question, you really need to go into it with the spirit of a pilot program, and you need to have audits. So with that, I just hope you publish signs to tell people, so that could be part of it, and just really be careful before you implement an expensive thing that may end up creating a culture that isn't inviting what we've been working hard to get out of, which is a system that uh, implicates people based on who they are rather than what they bring. Um, thank you so much. Welcome. Hi, Chris Herod. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council. I just have a quick question. I want to know what the procedure uh, is going to be if there's misuse, if we discover some misuse of this system. Um, what happens? If, what, what, who does the review? What are the consequences? Does it come back to council, et cetera, that kind of thing? Thank you. Any other individuals for in-person comment? Seeing none, we'll move to Zoom. Mayor, it doesn't look like there's anybody on. Oh, I spoke too soon. Mark McMullen. OK, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Welcome. OK, thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I was a little late getting to the meeting, and um, I'm not exactly sure. I was listening to um, Council Person uh, Mitchell's um, questions, and I was uh, uh, I'm what I got out of that was that there are two databases that are being used: one for the fixed uh, cameras and one for the parking cameras. Um, my concern is about the uh, license plate reader for the parking uh, violations. That's something that I don't think needs to be um held for uh a year i think that 30 days is uh is appropriate for parking violations um dealing with what the uh um chief said about um parking tickets blowing away or something like that i don't um i don't think that that's a reasonable amount uh, a, a reasonable reason to keep these for a year uh i think that for privacy uh 30 days for parking uh reader is fine um i think that uh understanding the fixed cameras is um for a longer period is um definitely understandable but uh i just um i, I don't see that tracking the uh the the license plate uh, parking violations is important for a year i think that 30 days would be appropriate thank you That is it, Mayor. Thank you, Rena. Um, so before we bring this back to council, there was um, two questions during public comment around locations and then also the cost of this program. Um, they were both included in the agenda packet, but in the spirit of transparency, I'd like you to speak to that a little bit more, please. Absolutely, thank you, Mayor. So um, as far as locations, as discussed at the last meeting and as illustrated, perimeter deployment system, which would hit the major ingress and egress points um, of our city limits. So it would be around the perimeter, around the edges, to be able to capture those vehicles coming and going um, in those locations. And the costs of the program, 
the cost is 2,500, approximately $2,500 per camera per year. We're looking at five locations. What we have to do is hone down a little bit better on those locations and roadway widths. And does one camera capture a location or does a location take more than one camera? So that would be work we would do next after we receive direction from council on whether to proceed with the program is really dialing that in that number to um, get a total cost, but again, $2,500 per camera. Thank you. All right, bringing this back to council for further discussion and action. Um, I, I appreciate the, the questions and also the questions from the community. Um, I think it is important that we have this program. Um, and I think cost-wise, it makes sense. A couple of things on the, it, where's the, the chart with the, the recommendations you're looking for? So I think you're looking at timing, correct? Not the chart, I'm sorry, the recommended actions. It's an executed sole source agreement and executed service agreement, correct? So, so yeah, the rec well, we're Oh, by sorry. motion, provide us direction whether to proceed with the fixed LPR program or not. And then also, if there's direction to proceed, do we amend the city's record retention schedule related to data collected by the fixed LPR system? Okay, so on the first one, yes, I would recommend we proceed. On the second one, um, I had conversations. I have a number of uh, family members, members that are in law enforcement, police, sheriff, as well as CH, well, not officially in the family, but engaged so soon, <laughs> CHP. And I asked the question of them, you know, with, because uh, they, they're they all in different cities, not here. And then I also had the conversation with the chief as well. And I think for the fixed, overall, a year seems a long time. I, I absolutely agree. It has to stay at least a year. I appreciate the approach that you're taking with the parking tickets if somebody, you know, you you may not know you got a ticket until you go to register your car. And then at that time, I, I think it's nice that you're <laughs> allowing somebody to potentially argue that and say, hey, when, why did I get this? Here you go. Um, but on the fixed system, what I heard was 30 days, like you were saying, is the bare minimum. But sometimes leads come in slowly. And I heard, you know, 60 to 90 days is probably about right. And like you said, it, it sounds like the majority of the 30 days fine, but this is really giving our police officers the additional tools to help solve some of these crimes quicker. We've had issues over the last couple of years, whether it was somebody lighting fires uh, all over Hillsburg coming through town and something like this would have been very helpful, I think. And in investigating crimes like that. We've had a number of shootings as well, where um, my understanding is sometimes, you know, there we don't have immediate data on that's needed. So my thoughts are, yes, proceed with it. Um, I would say 90 days retention. I think if we're already retaining it, um, we have the policy and procedures and penalties in place that that data is handled correctly. And so I'd be comfortable with 90 days to make sure that you've got enough time and for the parking, leave it at a year. I, I, I think um, the policy that's in place is good. So those are my thoughts on this. Vice, Vice Mayor Kelly. I concur with Council Member Higley, thanks. I do too. I think, that, I think those are good recommendations and I always, I just wanted to ask one other question is about the signs. Somebody suggested that we have signs show, saying that we've got these uh, cameras. Is that something that we've considered or are considering? I, I have absolutely no issue with signs. I'd have to consult with my friends over in the public works department about what signage would be around intersections and the placement of those. Vice Mayor Kelly. While I'm not a law enforcement expert or investigator, I would have to wonder if you are intending to go into Healdsburg to commit a crime with the intent of committing a crime or looking for someone to cause harm, and you are aware that there are signs posted that say, we're watching your license plate, Is that do you believe that that would deter crime or do you believe that that would make it 
likely that someone would try to conceal their license plate or use someone else's car to commit the crime because we're putting them on notice of these these systems. I, I'm genuinely asking, Chief, because I've hadn't thought about putting people on notice with signage about the fact that we're looking at their license plates. All I can say is anything is possible. Uh, what one thing we know is crime sometimes just happens. Other times crime happens and someone is coming into a jurisdiction to commit the crime. Whether they know about LPR systems being in place, whether they know that there are surveillance cameras down every street between ring cameras and blink cameras and all those, most of the time criminals aren't thinking about that as they're out there trying to commit a crime. Um, so yes, there is a potential that someone will try and conceal their plate. Um, if they use their friend's car, I'm sure that friend will be telling us who was driving their car when they committed the crime in Hillsburg when we show up at their doorstep. So, so to confirm, you don't think that if we posted signs that it would impede the system's ability to do the work that we're paying for? What, what it has a greater potential of doing is having people go, I'm not going to come to Hillsburg and commit that crime. But uh, Council Member Mitchell. So just to clarify on, on the signs, it's, yeah, yeah, I agree. It's not necessarily that we think criminals are going to read them and then turn around and go to Santa Rosa, right? No, but it's also letting the community know that the signs are there. And I think it's, I think that's more the point, isn't it? Of, of allowing people to realize that they are, they're on camera. So is this like the speed tracked by aircraft as you're driving down the freeway yeah something <laughs> maybe it's not important but i just think it's worth talking about maybe yeah uh, the, you know, for for me the, the 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 signage piece i think maybe requires a little bit more discussion from the council maybe you can once we give you direction by motion um and get a report back with your conversations with the consultants around what the best approach should be around signage i think I'd be curious to to have that specific. We come back to council um, that one component, but I agree with my fellow council member Hagley and his recommendation around having um, the retention of the data um, for uh, uh, for ninety days at maximum. Um, and I agree with staff's current recommendation as it is with the modifications from my fellow council members. I move to uh, approve or direct staff to proceed with the fixed ALPR program and to amend the city's record retention schedule to a 90 day for the fixed ALPR cameras. Second. I get a roll call, please. Councilmember Higley? Yes. Councilmember Mitchell? Yes. Vice Mayor Kelly? Yes. Mayor Jimenez? Yes. Thank you, Chief Jenkins. Okay, so now moving on to new business item A agreement with Sonic and Development Group Inc. for dark city uh, for city dark fiber implementation. Welcome. Good evening, Council and Mayor. My name is Adam McKenna. I am the city's information technology manager, and tonight I'm very excited to present on our dark fiber and internet enhancement project, which is specifically designed to enhance internet city internet and communication connectivity between our city facilities. Next slide, please. Our recommended actions tonight include adopt a resolution approving the authorization, approving and authorizing the city mayor to execute a sole source service agreement and other documents necessary with any non-substantive changes to as approved by the city attorney with Sonic to upgrade the city internet and intranet connections not to exceed 539,290 over five years and execute a service agreement with other documents as necessary with Development Group Inc. for network hardware configuration installation, not to exceed $102,101. Next slide, please. Currently, city internet services is purchased on a month to month contract, and that's both with AT&T and Comcast. Um, internet is connected at both City Hall and the police department in our data centers, and then dispersed to all of our other sites through an AT&T hub and spoke design network. And what that means is AT&T sits at the center of all of our connections. 
If we want to transmit data from City Hall to the community center, it passes through AT&T. And that affords us few benefits, but provides a couple risks in data transmission, slowdown security, and um, costs over time if we want to increase our speeds. Sonic, a locally based service provider, has increased the presence of dark fiber within the city and offers the city significantly more robust secure and secure cost-effective fiber connectivity to the internet. They've also began providing dedicated dark fiber site-to-site -site connections. They also have the ability to present dedicated dark fiber connections between city facilities for approximately the same cost as our current month-to-month -month contracts with AT&T and Comcast. These dark fiber connections remove that hub and spoke design and give us direct connections between all of our facilities, meaning city halls directly connected to our other sites. And that removes the middleman. Next slide, please. The table on the screen shows our current existing speeds between at our sites, as well as the potential increases based on the sonic proposal. We can see that city hall and police department internet connections gain a 5x speed increase from one gigabit to five gigabits in this proposal. And our other sites gain up to a 200x speed increase. Sites like our police department and city hall gain an additional connection between our data centers, which, all, which allows for a number of enhancements to our data transmission. And Sonic also affords us the capabilities of new connections, both at Gauntlet, our Gauntlet transmission tower for our redundant point-to-point -point wireless network, as well as an opportunity, an option to look at other locations such as Plaza Park. Next slide, please. The Sonic proposal include, contract includes a cost of approximately 8,500, slightly more than we're paying now for 60 months, a one-time construction cost of approximately 30,000 to connect to the corporation yard with dedicated fiber and one-time costs for network hardware to be installed in our data centers to accommodate the dark fiber implementation of 102,000. Installation of the new connections will take approximately six to nine months with a goal of utilizing new connections by early 2023. Staff would continue to use AT&T at all sites until the new connections were tested and accepted by the city. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, Plaza Park, uh, the option for Plaza Park provides new opportunities. And with a connection there, we have the opportunity to enhance public Wi-Fi within the park. Um, currently, our Wi-Fi that we offer in the plaza hops from multiple wireless access points from City Hall and the police department to reach the park. Each time it hops, it loses 50% of its, its speed. And so by the time it hops approximately four times to the park, we're, gaining, we're getting one quarter of the actual transmission we're offering to the point where it's so slow and um, inconsistent that it's not worth continuing using that platform. It, we've been working um, on, staff has explored options to upgrade the Wi-Fi Plaza system and in conjunction with an option for Sonic in the park, we have an opportunity to increase speeds up to 500%, including stronger connectivity, IT visibility, and management. Updating the Wi-Fi system in the plaza would improve public Wi-Fi by providing fast, reliable internet available for plaza park, city events, and public use. Next slide, please. Staff has reviewed and analyzed several locations in the plaza. We've narrowed down the primary options to the gazebo. We've looked at preliminary designs and worked with the original constructors of the gazebo and key partners to minimize visual impact to the iconic structure. As you can see in the diagram, we start with the small storage shed to the side of the gazebo, and that is where we would land the sonic fiber and put our base network equipment. We would do a small trench from the, the storage shed back behind the gazebo underground, and then conceal cabling within the gazebo up to the cupola. Next slide, please. The only, at this point with our preliminary design, the only equipment or cabling that would be seen would be 
up at the very highest point inside the gazebo with six wireless access points mounted on their side. So very slim profile and some stealth cabling to present the wireless antennas, which you can see in the lower pictures that are about the same size and color as the face of the beams already um, present on the gazebo. As compared to the current um, bird deterrent, this is a very stealth and highly invisible install. Tonight's action would allow for the install of sonic fiber to the maintenance shed as part of the proposal. And if approved by council as a recommendation, staff would return requesting authorization to proceed on additional projects that would finalize the design and network gear, install the six access points and two antennas per access point, as well as look at repainting and refreshing the gazebo. Next slide, please. So we have options tonight. Adopt the recommended action. Staff would bring back an item for to the future meeting to a future meeting re requesting approval of the final design and contract needed to get the public Wi-Fi established once Sonic installs fiber in the Plaza Park, or amend the staff recommendation action to approve Sonic agreement without the fiber drop in Plaza Park. In either case, staff requests direction to turn off the ineffective Wi-Fi currently running in the plaza as well as the surrounding area. Next slide, please. For the contract with Sonic, um, we do have one modification to the recommended action. And due to the complexity of the telecom of telecom contracts, we, we are additionally requesting a change to the recommended action to give the city manager authorization to make non-substantive changes approved by the city attorney. Next slide, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your presentation, uh, bringing this um, back to council for discussion. Vice Mayor Kelly. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the gauntlet tower component of the project? Do sure. we currently have internet or fiber at that tower? And is that located at the water facility? And that's why we call it the gauntlet tower? Is it just one of the communications towers up on the hillside there? It's, it's near the water facility. Um, that site currently has not been able to receive a physical network connection before. However, it acts as a repeater for a wireless system that is our backup internet in case any of the physical lines within the city go down. It also provides the only internet to our water reclamation facility um, out on Foreman Lane. Um, with regard to the plaza, um, I'm, I'm curious if you have contemplated, I know um, as we get ready to break ground across the street on uh, the Foley Family Pavilion, which will become somewhat of a community hub for events. I think about um, like the Healdsburg Running Company, how they sometimes have, you know, their start or finish line on Center Street um, mm -hmm. for their running events, but we may have things like that that would take place or the Antique Fair, for example, things that have happened in the plaza historically, but could potentially shift off the mm -hmm. plaza to up and running. Um, how difficult would it be to add internet Wi-Fi to to the Foley site um, in the future? Should we want to use it for, say, an event where you need internet to purchase antiques or to log into the finish line of the race? So there's a number of methods that could potentially provide internet there. Um, what um, the option, what SonicNet is providing us, is more flexibility with potential locations. But um, the idea with the contract is that we would be able to look at op additional opportunities. Um, as far as the specific side, I'd have to confer with um, the rest of staff. And for the fiber line that's going to the courtyard, mm -hmm. is that, will it run overhead like on the power lines and the cost to get to that location is, or is it, is it underground? And then is the cost specifically because they wouldn't be putting it in that location otherwise, except for our need of taking it to that location? For the cost, correct. Um, I do not have the information right now of what direction they would be going over or under. And do you know if there is like a cost recovery opportunity, if there were other businesses in that area, like the Humane Society or Bacchus Landing, who would 
utilize it if we wouldn't be the sole bearer of that cost? Has that been considered or we just, we have to pay for it. And if other people get to utilize it, so be it. Uh, for for the contract for you tonight, we hadn't considered partnering or, or trying to partner with other businesses to to reduce the cost. We know that the cost to actually run the fiber out there is probably more than what we're being quoted. So there's from our, our our negotiations, we've gotten a good deal to get the fiber out there that's currently not out there at all. Um, so I'm assuming that part of Sonic's model is that other folks will be coming in and assuming some of that cost in the long run. But I can't say that with certainty tonight. And forgive me if my question's a bit too analog, but I'm having a hard time visualizing, um, you know, the police department, fire department, senior center, swim center. So are, is this, is this, you know, is the Plaza Gazebo the hub of the connectivity or will there be trench uh, the gazebo to the police department, to the fire department, like trenching underground overall? Is that or, or is this kind of Wi-Fi connectivity where each network is kind of has a relationship with each other? Again, it's a very analog question, so yeah. Um, sorry, for clarity, are we referring to the fiber network or the Wi-Fi specifically for the plaza? I'm asking for, for clarity on both. Okay, Yeah. so the fiber network, my understanding is most of Sonnet's design is aerial based on the poles within Hillsburg. And then there's some, final trenching to get to a building if there's a small span that would not be on the poles. So so there wouldn't be heavy impact of just ongoing trenches within our city during the given time of, of having to construct this network? Or the that, that's correct. Sonic already has been working with the city on expanding their service throughout the city. And where we already have underground conduit, they're running that line through the underground conduit where there, where there's poles as the option to to relay, they're they're attaching to poles. So uh, they're building out this network. We're tapping into it. Um, and then the additional requests really uh, in this item that are unique to us is the run to the courtyard because we are the we are the reason they would be doing that, at least to start. And then the trench, the direct line into Plaza Park for the Wi-Fi there, because that was only, obviously only be for our needs. Thank you, Assistant City Manager. Are there any other questions from the councilors? Councilmember uh, Higley? Um, in the context of emergencies, um, mm -hmm. I know just looking back on my experience, I think first time with tubs, uh, when just cell service was going out, it was mm -hmm. a big problem. And at the community center, I had AT&T, Joni Oka's had Verizon and he, mm -hmm. he was having a tether to me. So in terms of an incident like that, how does having the fiber, <clears throat> if we have a PSPS event, I'm assuming there's some backup and we still have access to can, can you talk a little bit about sure. additional security that this brings? Yeah. So one of the one of the fail over states that we've experienced in the past is what happens if something goes wrong with at ts equipment in the middle? And with dark fiber, Sonic's purely putting the fiber between our sites and it's plugged into equipment at our end at each side. And so there's one less spot for failover. Most of our sites have a generator and assuming that generator is running, that means it would power that equipment. As far as the redundancy, um, we have designed a multiple layer internet connectivity approach with failovers between both city hall internet connections and police department internet connections. And that's part of where the dual fiber strands between city hall and the police department come into play as is we can fail over not just within each individual site for internet, but between the sites. So police department could theoretically be providing city halls internet and further down the pipe could be pro actually providing internet straight to the community center. The, um, the gauntlet tower piece that was brought up a minute ago, um, right now there's no direct feed up to that gauntlet tower. So if, City Hall internet was to go down, the gauntlet doesn't necessarily have a connection back to any of the other sites. However, with the fiber connections that we're proposing to connect to that site, not only would they have a dedicated connection, they'd have a fast dedicated connection that could then feed a wireless signal back to any of the sites that have that wireless connectivity. Okay. 
Uh, that's helpful. I know that we've had conversations about the floating solar and eventually having battery capacity because I think that's what six or eight percent of the city's power. So if there's a PSPS event mm -hmm. and we get cut off, we'll have down the road have battery power to keep critical infrastructure running and be nice to just have those <laughs> communication lines not go down either. So that's that's really it. Last question in this one. I mean, it's kind of tongue in cheek a little bit, but will it also help improve the audio on our online version of our meetings? <laughs> <laughs> Very important question. <laughs> it could. It could. Uh, Council Member Mitchell. I just have one quick question. You were talking about the gazebo Wi Fi. Yes, ma'am. Um, that's separate and apart from all these other um, enhancements that we're talking about. We um, want to increase the Wi Fi there for community events, sales, that kind of thing. So, as proposed tonight, the connection to the plaza is included. Optionally, that could be removed. Um, the next phase would be to come back with additional information and an action item to replace the existing hardware in the plaza that would essentially blanket the entire area with good, strong wireless connectivity at significantly faster speeds. Now, if I could just jump in on the, on the purpose part of that to build on what Adam said, uh, yes, we, we see a real community benefit. We do not need, for the city's operational needs, we do not need Wi-Fi in the plaza, but we've all experienced the frustration of the system we have right now. And I'll give you an example. We just heard from the Healdsburg Center for the Arts, which has an arts festival coming up. Uh, we won't be in place at that point, but when you have vendors and a large gathering of people, um, yes, there's okay, cell coverage out there, but to have good, strong functioning Wi-Fi could be a real benefit to those types of events. So that's, and of course we have events there most weekends, it seems during the summer. So that would be a real benefit. And then just people spending time there uh, to have that robust Wi-Fi uh, is a lot better than having to use your cell service. So we do see a real benefit for the community. And one other question, you mentioned painting the gazebo as part of this process. Is that uh, going to be paid for by Sonic or the city, or is that just, a, a, do we have any costs associated with that? I know it's something that the community services department has been looking at, uh, and we've been talking about internally. The, the goal here was we would have to do a little work to the gazebo, uh, and so to time the, the repainting of the gazebo with the work uh, seemed like a natural fit. I know uh, Director Theming's gotten quotes around the ten to $15,000 range to repaint the facility, and so if, when we, if you approve tonight, we'd come back to you with an item that would outline that whole process, timeline, costs, uh, and you, you'd have a final uh, look at the proposed plans for the completed project. Uh, yes, Councilmember Higley. Sorry. Um, as we're talking about different locations, I think it's good to keep in mind Rec Park as well. So I know um, they really, the uh, auction was online and really helped the kids a lot. Um, so I think it's good to kind of keep that in the back of your, you know, on, on the list as well. And maybe then we can watch Prune Packer games from home too. <laughs> right. Um, so thank you for the, the comments counselors. Now we'll move to in-person comment. Uh, please welcome to the podium. Thank you, Mayor. Boy, everything I'm hearing is confusing. Why, why, why do you want people in the plaza to be on their phones. Why do you want people to encourage children in a public park to spend more time on their phone? Perhaps it's because I'm a substitute teacher still working with kids that are just trying to get off the screen. My motto has been get off the screen and look at the scene. I don't know what the benefit is. The public benefit, a robust internet system underneath the gazebo, I don't think you want that. I'm just going to ask you to remember the reason you're doing this, I thought, I'm looking at the why is to, and I appreciate the thoroughness of wanting to improve connectivity, but you're doing the electronic connections rather than the people. Our park is not a place. I, I just don't think it's the place that you want to get everybody crowded to get around to this high speed internet as much as Dane Jasper wants the account. Look, do the three North like 
um, Vice Mayor Kelly said, make that your hub where you're going to have people driving over, getting off a train or whatever to use the internet. Your public park, your plaza, as much as the art center wants that internet, it's not a merchandising area. It's a community park. I just want to emphasize that. I've used it. I dance in front of that gazebo. I don't want to be on the internet in the park. So I'm going to bring that up. The other thing is, if we want to do a good job of this, we really need to think about the why. So you want more connectivity? Okay, let's go literal now. Okay, literal, let's do it. How much money are you spending to do this? And what is it? If I were sitting in your seats, I would be questioning the budget and how much money you spend every month to increase this incredible connectivity. So I'm not against doing part of this, but I think you really don't want to rush into this because you really need to ask people, is the hub going to be an area that is perceived as a historical plaza that is in fact a place not to hang out to do internet work, but to read or to listen to a play or hear music or be with people or talk to their kids. Everybody's on their phone. I think we should discourage that in the hub of our town. Be what a lot of other resort communities are doing. They don't even have internet sometimes. I choose to vacation where there isn't internet. We shouldn't be doing merchandising on a park. So I just really disagree with anybody doing much to that plaza in terms of that. And I think there's enough people on their phones taking pictures and everything else without internet. Um, so I really caution you and please don't just jump into this. And all I can say is it's a lot of money. That's a half a million dollars plus. And what are you actually doing it for? And the plaza to me is sacred. I love it. You probably know that already. And I don't want to see more people hovering around the plaza, driving to the plaza to use the high speed internet that's under the new plaza gazebo that's been painted for 15 grand. Thank you. Ron Edwards, I had a question. I know that when I participate in a lot of events, I'm a vendor, there's a Wi-Fi fee um, to have that connectivity. And I'm wondering if that is going to be part of this to help recover uh, some of this cost over time. The other concern I have is how dedicated are we to this system? At my house, I have old fashioned copper. I have a cable. So I have a choice of going with Xfinity, AT&T or Sonic. And I really liked my Sonic for the first couple of months when it was $19.95, and now it's $65 a month. So is there something in the negotiation that after those 60 months that we're so hooked into the system, it's so part of the city that we have no other options to bid out to get a better price? You know, we're going to be held hostage. So that would be some of my concerns. Thank you. Seeing no other individuals for in person, we'll move to Zoom. First up is Mark McMullen. Hey, am I clear? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Um, I'm in support of the switch to Sonic. I think that it's a very smart move using the dark fiber. And bringing uh, high speed uh, throughout the city facilities is really going to increase a lot of things that we're able to do, the city is able to do. But I would also like to request that the council look at establishing a free citywide Wi-Fi system throughout the entire city. The broadband needs for the underprivileged and the senior community are great, and they were certainly shown during the pandemic lockdown. A way of gauging this need is to look at the free Wi-Fi hotspots that our public library gives out. They have nearly 100 hotspots that are always checked out. Uh, you can check them out for three weeks. They're non-renewable, but they're rarely available because people just hold on to them. And these are generally taking to um, you know, families uh, that, are, that are using them at home because you can have multiple connections on the hotspots. On any given day or evening, you can look for it. You will you'll see folks who will park their cars next to the library or um, downtown so that they can, and in many cases, their children, access the internet. If we can't afford to construct a citywide Wi-Fi network right now, then please consider funding more of those hotspots at the library um, because it's just so dramatic the need that that is that is that we have for the underprivileged community. Lack of broadband is a huge problem in thousands of homes in our city. 
please think about this major capital improvement program for all Healdsburg residents. Thank you. Mayor, it looks like that is it for public comment on Zoom. Thank you, City Clerk, bringing this back to Council for further discussion and action. But before, uh, can we pull up the slide with the recommended action for this evening? Thank you. Vice Mayor Kelly. Thank you so much for this presentation, Manager McKenna. And I think it's really incredible to see the speed increases that we're looking at. Um, I formerly worked at the community center and the Wi-Fi speed there is very challenging. And I know that our community services staff has struggled with, with that, the bandwidth issues there. Um, and also we often use it as our city's uh, evacuation center and hub for, for Red Cross. And so that was especially needed when we were, when we had limited communications otherwise. So um, I'm really excited that this is finally becoming an option for our city's residents for residential use, as well as for the city um, before us tonight. Uh, and I do remember during the pandemic, seeing kids in the plaza, trying to connect to Wi-Fi, seeing visitors trying to connect to Wi-Fi, uh, trying to utilize, you know, this, the, when the network pops up, people want to connect to it. It says free Wi-Fi. Uh, and then when it doesn't work, I think it really does um, demonstrate kind of a lack of, of service that we're putting out there, but then it doesn't actually function appropriately. So I, I acknowledge that we do have a challenge before us currently, and I think this is a great solution for it. Uh, I agree with with some of the, the folks who spoke. I think Mr. McMullen uh, put it wisely. We, we have a lot of folks in our community who do not have internet access at home. Either they can't afford it, or it is not um, possible if they live in like a rural outlying area. And so I think it's great to be able to offer that. I know there is Wi-Fi at the library that a lot of folks utilize. Um, so having it in our public spaces, I think is, is beneficial. And I know um, just in, you know, when you're trying to utilize it for a variety of purposes, whether you're sitting on your computer trying to read your council agenda in the middle of the plaza on a sunny day or um, recording a video or trying to upload something that having that connectivity is really helpful. So uh, I, I appreciate what's before us tonight uh, and the work that you guys have done to try to create uh, a connected network amongst all of the city sites and kind of thinking about today's uses, but also future uses for the various locations. And, and I definitely am, am supportive of where this is headed. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm also supportive of where this is heading as well. I think I think it's really important. Um, first, tongue in cheek, my Wi-Fi connection really slowed down right before this item. So I really thought that this was a setup from city staff. So just have to put that out there. Um, you know, what, what's striking for me is, is um, you know, many younger individuals um, who can't afford uh, a cell phone plan will frequently use Wi-Fi calling. Um, and so having that, that connecting piece where a young person could go to the library, could go to the plaza, the community center, like you mentioned, and get on a Wi-Fi call, especially when um, cell tower usage can go down during a fire event, I think is really critical from a public safety perspective around this. Um, and I think it's also in line with our goals and strategic initiatives in the year around um, connectivity within our city. It doesn't for me just relate to sidewalks and 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 um, to sidewalks, right? It also relates to, to this. And I think we have a bit of a responsibility to bring our city into the new age. And so a hundred, a hundred percent increase is already great. Seeing 500% increase um, is fantastic, um, especially post pandemic when, when many things scholastically in academia, you know, you're, you're, you're having to be in these virtual calls in these virtual meetings. Um, and so it's really, I think in line with where the direction of, of the city where, where folks really want us to go. So I appreciate your, um, your report. And then I also appreciate the recommended action um, with the amendment from the city attorney. I'll, I'll entertain an adoption I, of the resolution. I move to approve resolution authorizing the city manager to execute a sole source service agreement. Uh, as well as execute a service agreement and other documents with Development Group Inc. for the network hardware configuration installation um, of this system. 
Is that a, a thorough enough motion if, if you for both mind, items? Vice Kelly, I just want to ensure that you um, intend to include the change to, to allow the city manager to make any non-substantive changes as approved by the city attorney. Yes, thank you. I do. And also the uh, addition of the, the plaza for both the Wi-Fi and the painting, which I believe is included in the resolution, but wanted to include that. And I think there's direction to remove the existing system. Yes, we would like, I would also, I'd also like to include the removal of the existing. Thank you. I would second that. Thank you to roll call vote. Council Member Higley? Yes. Council Member Mitchell? Yes. Vice Mayor Kelly? Yes. Mayor Jimenez? Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so now moving to item B, adoption of the general fund surplus policy uh, from our finance manager, Katie Edgar. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Katie Thank Edgar. You. A little closer there. My apologies. Can you hear me now? Is that better? Yeah, that's great. Thank, Thank you. you. Katie Edgar, finance manager here. I'm here tonight to present to you the general fund surplus policy. Um, next slide, please. The proposed action tonight is to adopt a resolution approving a general fund surplus policy, establishing a framework for allocating unanticipated annual surplus in the general fund. Next slide, please. So we formally adopting financial policies provides the foundation for long-term fiscal health. It is a best practice that's promoted by the Government Finance Officers Association, and it's a common uh, collaboration point between the California Municipal Finance Officers Association. Some recent policies that you have updated and reviewed have been fund reserve policies for various funds, investment policy, the pension man liability funding policy, and tonight, the proposed policy for consideration is the general fund surplus policy. Next slide, please. So part of our active financial management includes a few existing processes. Um, we complete the annual bi sorry, biannual budget process, um, which creates the financial plan for the next two years. We also come back with quarterly financial updates because we know that things don't always go as planned. And so each quarter we review our revenues and align them with current trends and address any additional expenditures if there's been funds that are available. The guiding principles that are included in the biennial budget development includes our reserve policy, which is in place to mitigate against risk if things do not go as planned. We have that reserve funds that are available to protect our essential services and cover any unanticipated costs. Tonight, we're presenting the surplus policy, which is to address when things go better than planned, and we have excess available funds at the end of the fiscal year, and to ensure that those one-time funds are expended on one-time events and do not increase ongoing operational costs, and they provide for strategic investments that can help us reach our long-term goals. Next slide, please. So in discussing the general fund balance, it's important to look at the three different components. The first component is our reserve, and this is designated by our adopted reserve policy, which is set at 30% of our annual expenditures. The next component is the pension stabilization component, and this is uh, identified through our pension liability funding policy, and this represents the amount of general fund contributions that are currently in our pension trust fund. And finally is the unrestricted unreserved fund balance. And this is the amount of fund balance that's left when you take the entire fund balance and you set aside the reserve and the pension stabilization trust, this is what is left over. So when this number is negative, that indicates how much reserve we are currently using in that operational budget for that fiscal year. If this number is positive, that indicates the amount of funds that are excess and available for appropriations. The proposed policy defines a surplus as any unrestricted unreserved fund balance that exceeds $250,000. The purpose of that $250,000 threshold is to provide for any reasonable variances within our revenues and expenditures to the end of the fiscal year. Next slide, please. So the process of the surplus policy is proposed to integ integrate it within their third quarter financial update. So at the third quarter financial update, we bring to you estimates of the remaining revenues and expenditures we anticipate through the end of the fiscal year. 
we project our ending fund balance and calculate our unrestricted fund balance. If a surplus is identified at the third quarter financial update, staff will recommend allocations consistent with the proposed policy, and they will be incorporated in the budget through an amendment. To mitigate any risks of uncertain events happening that would change revenues or expenditures drastically to the end of the year, SAP will wait until the fiscal year end to confirm the amount of surplus available before implementing the approved council actions. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned earlier, the purpose of this policy is really to ensure that these one-time funds are spent on one-time expenditures. And so we have three general categories that are going to guide the allocations that are presented by staff. The first category is actions that reduce city debt or liabilities. Some examples of this may include ensuring fund solvency, paying off internal or external loans, making early bond repayments when available, um, making additional contributions to our unfunded pension liabilities, our UAL. And these actions are important because they can provide interest savings, they can ensure better bond ratings, and they can provide increased flexibility for future spending. The second category is contributions that result in investment returns or expand future revenue potential. Examples of these can include contributions to the pension trust fund and the long range planning fund. Um, it's always helpful when we can invest uh, our contributions into uh, examples where we can compound our fiscal benefits and where we can encourage economic development and increase potential future tax returns. The final component is, sorry, category is investments in capital assets. These examples can include deferred building maintenance contributions, contribution to our vehicle replacement fund, uh, contributions towards streets and drainage infrastructure and water and sewer infrastructure. Um, the helpfulness of making these investments when we have one-time funding available is it can help alleviate one-time burden on the city budget when it comes time to replace these assets. And it also provides us flexibility to proactively address these needs. Since we have those funding available, it's always great to set it aside for the future use. And that concludes my presentation tonight. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Katie, for that thorough presentation. Um, bringing this back to council for any 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 further question. Yes, Councilmember Mitchell. Um, regarding you, I think the three categories: reduce debt, invest, or invest in capital assets. Is that essential? So, if we were doing that, would you do an analysis of which one of those would be more beneficial at any given point in time? Yes, exactly, and that's why we're providing producing the three general categories so that we can make uh, proposed allocations depending on how much money is available and make sure it's actually um, an efficient use of those funds. Um, and we can uh, balance what is important in the fiscal landscape of that year. So we have a little bit of freedom to address um, what's important at that time. That's great. And then just one other question, you uh, we would wait until the end of the fiscal year before those were recommended. Um, would that be post audit or is it just when you close, finish closing the books. So we would, by incorporating it in the third quarter financial update, you will be giving us the appropriations that would allow us to make those changes um, before the financial audit. So we would wait until the end of the year to ensure that the cash is actually available and that we didn't have anything changed drastically, um, but we would have those uh, actual transfers or allocations completed before the financial audit process. Great, thank you, I like it. Just a really quick question. Is it um just curious as to why we're seeing you know this 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 presentation now versus our June budget process? Just curious. Yeah, so uh at the last year end budget in the third quarter update was the first time we had we had done this during my tenure here in terms of a having a surplus and b thinking about what was the best use of it. And so during that presentation, I believe I think council member Hagley actually asked. Uh, for us at some point in time to bring back kind of a, a policy that outlined a framework for how so it's a little off cycle um, but we thought it was a good time to bring it back uh, as we start planning for the you know as this year plays out and think about if there's a surplus at the end of the year what what would we possibly do with that so having your feedback now on those categories uh, as well as the process is super helpful for us as we go into our active financial management in the current year great thank you all right. Oh, goodbye, Samir Kelly. Um, question for. I'm curious. So I believe that when the budget is being developed, 
prior to when we receive it, um, there are conversations that happen between senior staff and, and your office around what will ultimately get um, adopted or promote, proposed for the council to adopt into the budget and what may not make the cut or, um, you know, based on either staff time priorities and, and oftentimes based on what we can fund. And I'm curious what, um, so for example, this year we we had a request uh, for, for arts funding. We put certain funds in the budget. Um, it seems as though that, that, that there was, you know, other pieces of the arts budget that had been requested and, and weren't funded, although none of that was was made, you know, we were not aware of that until the budget was proposed to us. And then um, we made a decision during the budget discussion to allocate some additional funds towards the arts uh, with the potential to figure out what, what specifically we're earmarking those funds for. Um, should we end up with a surplus in this year, uh, it, according to this policy, we, we probably wouldn't be allocating funds towards the arts, although it's been identified as a community priority and been identified as a um, priority in, in one of the department budgets. So I'm curious, how, how would that, how could a surplus function in a way to help fulfill some, some community priorities that may not fit under, you know, by spending down on, on debt or infrastructure, but kind of community capital. I'll take a stab at that and then the assistant city manager may have some thoughts and, and Katie as well. Um, first off, this is a guideline. So I, I think it's entirely plausible that in any given year with a surplus available, the council might look to do something to address a one-time need. Uh, the simple mantra I'll always put forward is one-time funding should go to one-time needs. And that's what that would be, potentially, depending on depending on how it's deployed. And, and the, the converse to that would be we wouldn't want to use that one-time surplus right to add multiple positions that we'd be paying for, as you know. So I, I, the simplest answer is that could be the result. And if we have a burning need, uh, I think that's appropriate. I think what we're also trying to do, though, is just make sure that we're creating a pathway where we might uh, fund the things that are harder to get to in the course of year by year budgeting. Um, and so the pensions, I think we've done a great job on, but it's not always the most fun thing to put money into. Uh, funds that actually earn interest, that's somewhat unheard of in my time in budgeting, but what a great idea, right? That we might actually make investments when we have extra money and things that will generate more money. Um, so, so that's the goal of those guidelines, but it, it Absolutely, we could put money toward a one-time need. We may also be able to merge those two ideas. There may be an opportunity. One of the conversations around the arts is for grant programs. Uh, the city once had a community grant program that was supposed to be using the earnings uh, of a large principal endowment, and there may be a world in which we could create, and I'm just kind of winging it here. I'm not suggesting we'll do this next month, but there may be a world in which we could do something like that too. And that might play into, you know, doing two things at once and being right consistent with this, this guideline and hitting those needs. So I think there's going to be a lot of shades of gray for year to year, but we're just trying to provide some, some framework to think those through. I'll just add just a little bit. So every year as we go throughout the operational year, there's needs that come up that are unanticipated or sometimes needs that we know that we just, to your point, we, we don't always have the funds to get to. And so, as we move through the year, we look at every opportunity and the fund in which that opportunity would operate out of uh, to try to come up with solutions, right? So in this case, with arts funding, for example, we're funding that out of community services budget right now. We would, we'll take the same approach we do with the general fund that's per, the policy that's before you tonight with the community services fund. And if at the year end we see, you know, expenses are... Uh, less than anticipated or revenue substantially over, that gives us the same opportunity to come back and offer alternatives for one-time spending with those funds. Matter of fact, we did that this past year with the set aside of the additional million dollars in deferred maintenance uh, action that we had asked you all to take because we knew we were going to have more revenue than we had originally anticipated. Uh, and so that that it, you know we're, we're really trying to formalize the approach we've been taking uh, with council over the last year and a half here. And while this policy is specific to the general fund, that's that's our our mindset in active financial management. This is we're going to do this with every fund, with every opportunity we see, and, and bring back uh, what we think are 
the best alternative uses for remaining funds out there on an annual basis. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so now we'll move uh, to in-person public comment. Welcome. Good evening, council members. Deborah Kravitz from Healdsburg. I'm not sure it fits the model um, that was just presented, but I'm wondering if it's possible in the third category for investment, if there could be a fund created for the city to do some land banking. And when we have excess uh, funds in the general fund, if it can be used as a pot of money to acquire occasional small lots that come for sale in Healdsburg, so that the city can do some, um, a variety of different options in terms of infill housing building. We don't seem to have a fund for that now. And if we do have excess funds some year, it might be nice if we could build that type of housing fund if it fits into that policy. Thank you. Any other individuals for in-person comment? Seeing none, we'll move to Zoom. There is one, Mark McMullen. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, I just have a, a question. I just want to clarify this. I believe that this is about the general fund and that the um, the TOT monies that are the community services uh, would not be applied in this particular area as far as um, if there was a overage in the TOT um, community services fund. I, I, I just want to see if that would be something that would be used for the arts rather than the surpluses from the uh, general fund. Uh, secondly, um, I'd like to agree with uh, uh, Deb Kravitz about uh, the land banking. I think that's a great idea. I would love to see that added onto this list. And the long range planning fund, I think, is something that is desperately in need of funding um, for the long term. I think that uh, we really need to be thinking about the general plan update. And since we have ignored it for the last 10 years, we have no money really in that fund to go. So. Thank you very much. There is nobody else on Zoom at this time. All right, thank you. Um, bringing this back to council for further discussion and action, if we can get the recommended, um, the staff recommendation slide up. Council member Higley. Yeah, I think, um... The suggestions that we heard, I think, are great, but I think that's the reason for a policy like this, because, you know, the land banking, we're looking at potentially having modification to our TOT uh, to be able to bond against it if the voters support that. So there are a lot of different avenues. And I, what I like about this is it really narrows it to trying to pay down debt, capital improvements, some of these other things that are not the most exciting flavor of the moment crisis of the day things, but really have a long-term impact on the health and stability of our finances. And this is just one small little piece that this council has an opportunity to add on to our pen pension stabilization fund. The fact that we have a 30% budget reserve when we have neighboring cities that are talking about tax increases on their residents to be able to pay for basic city services. So we're talking about the extra here. And I really like the idea that, you know, we go through a very robust budget process that's very transparent, a lot of meetings, uh, everything's out there. We have the discussion and it's a two-year budget with constant updates. If things change, we're always on it to make changes that work best for the city. But I like the idea that if there is a surplus, I mean, the fact that we're even talking about surpluses as opposed to deficits at the city of Healdsburg, I think, says something. So I, I support this, um, and I'd be happy to offer a resolution if there's support from my fellow council members. Go ahead. Okay, well, I would offer a resolution of the city council, the city of Healdsburg, adopting the general fund surf surplus policy. I second that. 
Roll call vote, please. Councilmember Higley? Yes. Councilmember Mitchell? Yes. Vice Mayor Kelly? Yes. Mayor Jimenez? Yes. Thank you so much, Katie. I also, before uh, before we move on to the next item, I just want to say I really appreciated the public comment. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, this council, through its budget process every year, will will have an opportunity to weigh in on these one-time funds in the future. Thank you so much, Katie. Now moving on to item C, Sonoma County Library Commission vacancy. Uh, form a subcommittee to interview the applicant or consider appointing Andy uh, Elkind to a four-year term on the Sonoma County Library Commission. There's no presentation, I take it? Okay. That's well, correct. I met with him, so I support <laughs> reappointing him. I think he's done a really good job. I do too, and I'm really impressed with his background and experience, as well as his willingness to continue working in this capacity. So I support that for sure. I echo the comments, and I think that while it's always great to have them going, hiring a new uh, new leadership and going to the ballot to renew their, their tax um, measure. I think having consistent, steady, knowledgeable people who have knowledge of kind of the history is really important at this juncture. And I think Andy is um, a great commissioner and has been very communicative for the city. Um, and I feel more connected to the library system now than I think in years past. So I think it's, it's great to have him continue in that role. And I think he's aware of um, the challenges that that we face, you know, as a community in making sure that our libraries are really accessible for everyone who who need them. Um, so, thank you. Um, so we'll we'll move straight away uh, to public comment for in person folks first. Seeing none, we'll move to Zoom. We have one, Mark McMullen. Hello, I would um, uh, just like to uh, speak in favor of Andy. He's a great representative for Healdsburg. Um, uh, he's done a great job representing us on the commission. Um, one of the things I would like to ask is that with the departure of council person Palacios, we don't have a council representative at the library meetings anymore, um, just to point that out. So, um, Anyway, if you could have somebody attend at least one of the remaining meetings before the end of the year, that would be that would be good. And also, um, I would ask that you write down questions when they're asked in public comments. So perhaps you could answer them uh, before you take your vote. Thank you very much. There's no one else wanting to provide public comment on this item. Okay, bringing this back to Council for Action, I'd entertain a motion to appoint uh, Andy Elkind to the four-year term on the Sonoma County Library Commission. So moved. Second. Roll call vote, please. Councilmember Higley? Yes. Councilmember Mitchell? Yes. Vice Mayor Kelly? Yes. Mayor Jimenez? Yes. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor, can I just add? Sure. Um, one of the public commenters mentioned that we do not have a liaison to the Library Commission, but I did want to just mention that at our last council meeting, we filled all of those vacant appointments, and I believe it's Mayor Jimenez, who is now our esteemed liaison to the Library Commission. That is very true, Vice Mayor Kelly, and thank you for reminding everyone in the room. Moving on to item number 10, council reports on matters of interest occurring since previous regular meeting. I have something. Um, I was wondering if we could get an update from the city manager on, uh, we'd, we've talked about a downtown density study and then we had a, um, there was a project and I don't wanna talk specifics, but there was recently a project that maybe could have used a higher density um, or a parcel like that. And I, I guess my question is, it, my understanding is that how the huge the housing element working group is going to be taking up a density discussion is that correct yeah i'll, I'll answer this solely from a uh, agenda management request uh, <laughs> standpoint uh but yes i i can speak to that actually because i i think i hear you requesting an opportunity to to hear more and weigh in on, on the density study uh and so what i can say is that their next meeting the housing element work group 
uh, is scheduled and agendized to really provide their input on this phase two that we've talked about. And that was one of those things that they have expressed an interest in and this council has. Um, so that meeting, unfortunately, due to a lack of quorum, had to be rescheduled last week, but it should happen soon. Um, and our best guess would be the end of September or the beginning of October. So pretty soon, within the next handful of meetings, uh, we would bring back their feedback and staff's feedback and, and agendize a city council discussion of that item and additional components of what they envision and see value in to do after completion of the, the housing element itself. So short answer is yes. Uh, we in, in the rather near future, we intend to bring that conversation back to you and have a chance to talk about it in more detail. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm hoping that part of that discussion includes, you know, some quantitative recommendations come out of that. Maybe there's some samples of hey, this parcel, this is what could be done related to, you know, clarification on, you know, uh, not just density, but, you know, setbacks, parking requirements, you know, something more actionable versus just, um, oh yeah, we want more density downtown and maybe some specifics, but I think that's kind of what I would like to see. Okay. And that's all I had. Council member Mitchell. Just a couple little things. Um, I was at the parks and rec commission at meeting for my first time as the liaison to the parks and rec. And that was nice. Um, and then I attended the mayors and council members meeting uh, zoom with vice mayor Kelly and, uh, and, City Manager Kay, who presented about the update on the protocols, I think it was, was that? Bylaws. Bylaws. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. Um, I want to add, well not add, um, recently this week, um, I went to Los Cien's um, Farm Workers Safety Program um, with um, a, a winery, I, I, I can't recall the name right now, um, and North Bay Jobs with Justice. And so it was really great to see two council members um, from Healdsburg in that room. And so I just wanna appreciate um, council member Hagley for attending um, that really important conversation um, in our community and in our county. Great, and I attended the mayors and council members uh, meeting as well. And uh, for, for the folks out there who wonder what that is, it's a meeting of all of the mayors and council members from all nine cities uh, across Sonoma County. And we've been doing a lot of work around uh, discussions around housing and homelessness and what other cities are doing. And uh, it's been a, a great uh, opportunity to really get to see what, what some of the other cities in Sonoma County are championing. And um, with that, we're going to be, I, I believe, adopting some changes to the bylaws and at an upcoming meeting that will allow the that group to function in a more robust way. And I look forward to to um, discussing if needed and adopting those changes at the step in that journey. Is that one still going to be on Zoom or are they going to go back in person? I believe this past one was going to be in person and then they decided kind of at the last minute to put it on Zoom. So um, there was really funny opening remarks that said, I hope everyone's enjoying the. the <laughs> uh, those, yeah, those are great meetings in person because you really get to know the other elected officials and kind of talk offline about what each city's doing. Um, I did want to add that I did attend the Cafecito. I'm pronouncing it correctly mm -hmm. after yes. all. Thank you, Councilmember Hagley. And uh, it was very well attended, I think. Uh, it was 40, maybe 45 people over there. Uh, Mambo's Pizza was served. Um, they broke out into two groups. Um, and so I'm looking forward to the feedback that comes out of that one. And then we have another one coming at the library. On the 19th? 29th? 29th. Okay, 29th at 6 p.m., correct? Okay. I'm sorry. Yes, I had one, one more thing to mention. Um, next week, we have the Healdsburg Chamber of Commerce barbecue um, at Rodney Strong Vineyards. And I know um, some members of the community plan to attend. They're doing their, the award ceremony is back. Uh, so that's something to look forward to as well. So that's coming up next Wednesday. And I believe tickets are on sale and open to the public. Well, without further ado, we are um, adjourning this meeting at 8.04 p.m. He had 8.27. What is that? Um, Thank you, everyone. Sorry.